my privilege to introduce our luncheon speaker for today, Chris Chicola. Chris is the president of the Club for Growth, the leading limited government free enterprise political advocacy group. He served on the Club for Growth's leadership council since 2007. He grew up in Michigan and met his wife, Sarah, during their days at Hillsdale College. After working his way through law school, he moved to Indiana, where he worked for CTV Incorporated, a leading manufacturer in the agriculture equipment industry. He became the company's CEO in 1994, and in 2002, he ran for Congress from Indiana's second congressional district and represented that district for two terms. While in Congress, he supported pro-growth tax cuts, decreased government spending, personal social security counts, the protection of political free speech, and less government regulation. He served on several committees, of course, the Agriculture Committee, Small Business, Transportation and Infrastructure, and the Ways and Means Committee. His experience in business and in Congress reaffirmed his long-held belief in the importance of reducing the government's reach and enacting pro-growth policies. Speaking today on economic issues and the 2012 elections, please welcome Chris Chicola. Good afternoon. <clears throat> thank you, Anita, for that kind introduction. Um, I want to thank Hillsdale for the opportunity to join you today. Um, as Anita said, I am a Hillsdale College graduate. And going to Hillsdale was the second best decision I ever made in my life. Um, the, first be the first best decision, obviously, was I met my wife, Sarah, there uh, 27 years ago. And Sarah and I still love to go to Hillsdale events. Uh, we love to meet great Americans that attend these events. We love to hear great speakers that speak at these events. And one of the things we also love to do is meet the students that currently go to Hillsdale, which I might say are much higher quality than when I was there. Um, but uh, these students are so impressive, and I got to meet one of them not long ago at a Hillsdale event at the Constitution Day celebration in, in Washington, D.C., and we were at a lunch much like this, and I was sitting at a table much like that, and um, Dr. Arn was at the table, and uh, Michael Mukasey, the former Attorney General of the United States, was at the table, and sitting next to him was this student at Hillsdale, currently, I think, a junior. And Dr. Arn, much as he does once in a while, started giving this student a very hard time. And uh, he started asking her simple questions like, what is the meaning of life? And, and much to her credit, she looked Dr. Arn right in the eye and she said, you know, Dr. Arn, ever since I had you in that Constitution class, I'm not afraid of you anymore. So, I think I need to take that class because I'm still a little bit afraid of him. But, uh, so it is great to be here, and um, my assigned topic today is economic issues and the 2012 election. After that very uplifting, optimistic presentation we had this morning, um, I'm tempted to say I think we're all going to die and just sit down. But uh, that probably wouldn't be. But I'll tell you, I did struggle a little bit with coming up with my remarks uh, because of the topic. Because my experience in Washington as a member of Congress and is now uh, president of the Club for Growth has been that economic issues and elected officials, uh, elected officials have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Uh, because unfortunately, there are very few members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, that have any fundamental understanding of how you create jobs, wealth, and economic growth. And if you couple this basic lack of fundamental knowledge, with the fact that almost every single special interest group in America hires Oliver Twist as their lobbyist, who is a pickpocket who always wants some more, and members of Congress perceive that they don't get reelected by saying no to questions like, can I have some more? What we have today and what we heard this morning is that we simply have a government that's just too big to succeed. So I think really the economic crisis in the 2012 election may be a more fitting topic for our discussion this morning. Because as we heard, it's, an undeni it's undeniable that the size of government has gotten too big, our debt, our deficit are unmanageable, and, and they are um, made minuscule by our unfunded liabilities. I was going to give you a whole list of statistics to put our unfunded liabilities into context for you, but I think 
That was done well this morning, and we just had lunch, and I think we've had all of that that we need. But as it was pointed out this morning, that um, you know things that don't go, can't go on forever don't. And so it really boils down to what do we do about all this? We all agree we have an unsustainable fiscal crisis. So what do we do about it? And whether we like it or not, whether we intend to or not, I think the 2012 election is going to establish a path that we take. And that path is either going to be, as was described this morning, the balanced budget amendment with teeth, we're going to default, or we will renew our American spirit and head off on a path of economic growth and reform. Some people say, you know, this is pretty easy. Why don't we just act like adults? You know, if we just sat down and acted like adults, and if the parties would just put their partisanship aside, and if we could just find common ground, everything would be fine. Well, I, I wish it was that easy. It's not, and as uh, my friend Senator Jim DeMint from South Carolina, I know we got a lot of South Carolinians here, uh, who, by the way, has done more for the cause of freedom inside the halls of Congress than anybody in the last several years. Uh, but Jim DeMint puts it, puts it uh, very succinctly. He says, you know, I've never seen a bipartisan bill that actually shrinks the size of government. And I think, for that matter, there hasn't been a partisan bill that shrinks the size of government either. But, you know, there is hope. I, I, I thought I was going to be the pessimist today, but after this morning, I guess I'm the optimist. There is some hope. Um, and I do agree with Daniel Hannon when he said last night that people are really ahead of the politicians. And I believe that unlike the halls of Congress, the American people still have an understanding of economic reality. They still kind of get what creates jobs, economic growth, and prosperity. And I was reminded of this in a very dramatic way one day on my way home from work. Uh, when I served in Congress, I had a little row house uh, about a block and a half from my office, which was in the Cannon Building. And um, one night I was walking home late, and it was dark, and out of nowhere this guy, masked gunman, jumped out and put a gun right in my ribs. He said, give me your money. Well, I was a little taken aback, as you might imagine. I didn't know what to do or say, so I blurted out, you know, do you realize you're trying to rob a member of the United States House of Representatives? And he looked at me and he said, well, give me my money. <laughs> so, so there is hope. Um, I think, it is, as my mass friend pointed out, there are certain undeniable truths uh, when it comes to economics. So one of them is, you know, he who earns their, their money spends their money more wisely than anyone else. Now, he might not have been the greatest example of that. But, you know, I do think the world has changed. I think the Tea Party movement is an indication of that. I think is very healthy for America. When I was a member of Congress, I did 150 town hall meetings. I got as many as zero people to show up at times. And I, I was a member of Ways and Means in the Budget Committee. I worked with Paul Ryan and Jeb Hensling on budget process reform. And I would go to my town hall meetings and talk about budget process reform. And that's why nobody would show up. Um, but today, we're talking about how much less we will spend rather than how much more will we, spend, we will spend. And I don't think that we can underestimate how significant that is. And so we've got a long way to go, but at least we're having the, um, the right debate. And for the first time, and certainly in my lifetime, I think people are willing to listen. They're willing to listen to the challenges that we face. And they may even be willing to listen to the solutions that we're going to have to pursue. But it's going to take leadership to get us there. More on that in a minute. Um, part of what I think they will listen to is history. And I think history has proven time and time again when America embraces pro-growth policy, things like free trade, pro-growth tax policy, streamlining regulations, economic growth, wealth, and prosperity are created. It happens every single time. On the, on the other hand, when America experiments with Keynesian-style stimulus spending, economic growth, wealth, and prosperity are diminished. It happens every single time. The only problem is it seems to be a lesson that we refuse to learn. Um, of course, the most recent example of, of our refusal to learn this lesson is the $800 billion so-called stimulus bill in 2009, which has given us no demonstrable evidence that it's created economic growth or jobs. Uh, it works so well that now the president is proposing another half a billion dollars almost in Stimulus II or the Jobs Act. Uh, but, you know, this is nothing new. Uh, Hillsdale's own Professor Bert Folsom 
uh, wrote in his, in his really great book, New Deal or Raw Deal, he described that the policies at FDR during the Depression were really an economic disaster. Uh, but this is not just a Democrat problem. It has bipartisan support. In 1975, Gerald Ford tried temporary tax rebates. He tried Social Security bonuses. And in 19, 1977, not to be outdone, Jimmy Carter tried similar temporary tax cuts as well as stimulus spending on infrastructure and aid to state and local governments. And we all know by 1980, uh, our country was experiencing persistent unemployment and massive inflation. Is, is Recently, as 2008, George W. Bush thought he'd try it and see if he could get a better result. He tried temporary tax rebates to try to jumpstart the economy at that time, did little to help spur the economy, and gave us the 2009 uh, Obama stimulus bill. So this would maybe lead us all to ask the question, um, why do we do that? And when in the world, and when in the history of the world, is Keynesian-style economic spending actually created economic growth and jobs? Well, the question is quite literally never. And even the most enthusiastic Keynesians, people like Paul Krugman, who have actually heard answer this question, would agree with that conclusion. But they have an explanation. And their explanation is, no, it's never actually worked because we've never spent enough. <laughs> and this gets where Daniel Hannon described last night, you'd actually have to be an economist to believe this. And they, their explanation is, you know, we've never spent enough because in the face of rising debt and deficits, we've lost our nerve. And if we would have only kept our nerve and maintained our spending pace, everything would have been just fine. And it's kind of a neat argument because you can't disprove it. You know, you could always spend more. And you could always say, if we just did a little bit more, we'd be okay. And I'm afraid that we currently have an administration that wants to test that theory. But on the other hand, um, it has. Uh, it has and can be proven that pro-growth policies like lowering marginal rates, making the uh, regulatory burden on businesses lower, making us more competitive in a global, uh, con uh, global economy uh, actually works. And you don't need a PhD in economics to be able to recite the JFK tax cuts in the 60s, the Reagan tax cuts in the 80s, and the Bush tax cuts in 2003. I was a member of Congress in 2003. I voted for those uh, tax cuts, and I'll never forget sitting on the floor of the House in late 2003 and early 2004 and listening to the Democrats rail about the jobless recovery. Well, that's the recovery that drove unemployment down to almost 4%, and I would say that's a recovery we could use right about now. So history has shown us what works from a pro-growth standpoint, and we could you know, say, why don't we just do that? But growth is not enough. As we learned this morning, we have to also have fundamental entitlement reform. I don't think any economist would say that we can grow our way out of this problem. And so we really need a dual path. One is implement pro-growth policies that we know that history has shown is a path forward. And two is to have the political will and courage to start to tackle meaningful entitlement reform. So why don't we do that? Well, the answer is simple, and I think you all know the answer, and that's two things. One is we need leadership, and we need political will to get those things done. And they aren't easy to find, but I can recite one act of extraordinary political will and leadership in the recent past. And my example may surprise you. I have a great and morbid respect for the Democrats and their health care bill, also known as Obamacare. Now, I disagree with everything they did, but it was a core belief that they held for over 40 years. It's something that they woke up every single day saying, we have to have nationalized health care. It's a, something they saw an opportunity to do. They knew that the public opinion was not on their side. They knew that it would present a substantial risk that they would lose their majority, at least in the House, but they did it anyways. And it is now the law of the land. And I'm skeptical, no matter who the next president is, whether it will actually be fully repealed. And so it was truly an uncommon act of exercising the risk of leadership by politicians in Washington that we almost never see. And so in order for our country to be able to avoid the impending disaster that we heard about this morning, avoid the crisis that is undeniable, our country is going to need a champion of economic freedom that has similar determination and commitment 
to put this country back on a pro-growth path and to be able to uh, attack entitlement reforms in a, meaningful, in a meaningful way. We also heard, well, the current crop of candidates, you know, aren't inspiring us. I've heard of several people say that. And it was pointed out this morning, I think, rightfully, they haven't had time to talk to us. The debates are not a conducive environment to tackling these issues. The enemy of good government is 30 seconds, and that's all they get. And so we are going to have to find somebody that can rise above soundbite politics, somebody that can rise above class warfare politics, and can lead the, the country in a direction the history has proven works. And I think that we need someone that can inspire a generation. I grew up with Ronald Reagan. He was the first person I ever was able to vote for. My kids, Ronald Reagan is a guy in a history book. And all of you faculty members probably know better than I that these kids aren't showing up in your classrooms having been taught the virtues of the free market system. And so we need someone that's willing to go and talk about these things in an unabashed way that people actually hear them in order for the people to stay ahead of politics, like we talked about before. I think the people will always stay ahead of politics, but I'm not sure that's always a good thing. I think it's still a good thing today, uh, but I'm not sure it will continue to be if we don't have education for the next generation on why free markets work. And we really need someone to can echo the sentiments of Arthur Brooks. Some of you may know him, the president of the American Enterprise Institute. And he wrote a great book called The Battle. And he says, free enterprise has done more for the human soul than any amount of redistribution ever can. And I think that's something we need to instill in every generation. So we need someone that understands our challenges and more determined to fix them than to get reelected. We need to find somebody that can overcome the fear of losing their job as a politician because now really is the time for choosing. And I know it's a cliche because every candidate who runs for every office says in every election, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Well, 2012 actually might be the most important election of our lifetime because it's a rare election where voters have a clear understanding of the consequences of their vote when they go into a voting booth and they have a clear understanding that there's one of two paths we will take after all the ballots are counted. I mentioned I think the Tea Party is a great thing for our country, but I actually think the Occupy Wall Street movement, whatever you call it, is pretty good for our country as well. Yeah. Because not everybody's like us. We're not normal. We think about this stuff all the time. We come to these events and we want to do something about it. But the people that don't think about these things every day do sit in their family rooms and they do watch TV and they see Tea Party and they see Occupy Wall Street. And they will understand that there's a difference and they will have to determine which one they identify with, which one of those groups looks, sounds, and I guess maybe even smells more like me. <laughs> now, so I think that they are helping to clarify the choice that we have in 2012. 1980 was clearly one of those elections, and 2012 must be one of those elections, because whether we want to or not, again, whether we intend to or not, we are going to set a path that our country will take for the next generation at least. And <clears throat> whether we choose European-style European social democracy, like Daniel Hannan warned us last night, and all the great things that go with it, chronic unemployment, lower economic growth, diminished standard of living, or we can choose to be America again. In other words, we will either choose more government or we will choose more freedom. If we choose more government, I think we know what will happen. Uh, we will regain our nerve in the face of mounting debts and deficits. We will try to spend our way to prosperity, which I don't think is going to work. And we will try to disprove or prove a disprovable theory. And we will spend ourselves beyond hope. If we choose more freedom, I think there is hope, but I don't think there is certainty. I think um, our organization, the Club for Growth, uh, one of the things that we do is we publish white papers that's intended to be a objective analysis of the economic record of every one of the Republican presidential candidates. I encourage you to go to our website and look at it. It's clubforgrowth.org. And if you do, I think you'll probably conclude the same thing that we concluded. None of them are perfect. But I think there's something else that is true. All of them are better than Obama. And all of them have the potential to move the country in a pro-growth direction. And in order for us to meet our challenges, and if a Republican is elected in the 2012 um, election as president, they will have to exceed our expectations. And one way that they can do that is that they can look to the, next or the new generation of Republican governors 
people like Nikki Haley, who we're going to hear from tonight, people like Mitch Daniels from Indiana, that I come, where I come from, people like Chris Christie, people like Rick Scott in Florida, people like Scott Walker in Wisconsin. All of these governors are showing or choosing more freedom over more government, and they're showing uncommon leadership and political courage in doing so. They are clearly driven by a sense of responsibility rather than being driven by the latest poll. And they, like our president, they are busy cleaning up the mess they inherited, but unlike our president, they aren't looking for anybody to blame. And so our states are often called laboratories of democracy. I think some states today deserve a, a different title, and that's roadmaps to fiscal responsibility and economic growth. So history has shown us a path forward, how we can create economic growth again. This new generation of governors have shown us bold leadership that's necessary to start attacking and tackling our entitlement problems. And let's hope the next president uses both as a guide to meet the challenges that we all face and returns America to where we belong, and that's a beacon of economic freedom for the world. So thank you for the chance to be with you today. So I guess we'll do a few questions, if anybody has any. Sort of a two-part uh, question. How does your organization relate to the state organization which has the South Carolina? And how does that state organization relate to the individual citizen, the grassroots person like yourself? Uh, the Club for Growth, uh, we are we're a DC-based organization. We focus only on federal races, House and Senate, and we will get involved in presidential races. Uh, state organizations like the, the uh, South Carolina Club for Growth, which is a very good organization, focuses only on state issues and, uh, and elections. So uh, we try to stay out of each other's way, but our, our mission statements are the same when it comes to policy. We only focus on economic issues, pro-growth issues. We don't get into um, social issues or uh, national security or, or um, any other issues but economic issues. We are not a grassroots organization, the Club for Growth. We have 65,000 members. I'm not sure how many the South Carolina Club has. But what we try to do is act like a, vet, uh, a good housekeeping seal of approval. We have a vetting process where we try to determine champions of economic freedom that are running for the House or the Senate. We recommend them to our members and then ask them to support them financially. What it does is it gives our members leverage and that they know that this person is who they say they are. Uh, our job has gotten harder because every candidate running for every office walks into our, our conference room and says they're, they're a fiscal conservative. Um, our job is to, is to uh, vet that. But uh, when we endorse a candidate, we'll raise between $150,000 and a million, $150, a million dollars for the candidate. And uh, we help make sure that they are viable. And we make sure that our members uh, who choose to participate in the political process by giving contributions gain leverage. Our first focus, and I'll, I'll stop on that, our first focus is open, safe Republican seats. If there's going to be a Republican that's going to serve there, we want to make sure it's the most free market, pro-growth candidate possible. But our second focus is incumbents behaving badly. And so we challenge uh, Republican candidates in safe seats that aren't voting a pro-growth record. And when we beat them, two things happen. One, you get a better vote. And two, you scare the heck out of the rest of them. And uh, and that's uh, a motivating factor, as we heard this morning. Fear is a great motivator of politicians, and we try to make sure that they understand there's consequences to their behavior. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Jennifer Hall. I'm from Indiana. Um, I have a question. Speaking of Nikki Haley in South Carolina, I spent some time with her about two weeks ago up in, in Washington with Larry Childish. I love what she says, and I don't know if that is going on, too, but she will not accept federal dollars like the one governor of Georgia, Governor Bill is doing. I'm in Georgia. Uh, and that is the art fund that the, the transportation fund to to actually put in high school rail. Nikki says that once she does that, she is tied to government and their new rules and regulations. I totally agree. How can you nudge Governor Bill of Georgia, who is a good conservative man? I helped elect him. How do we nudge him over to see that once the federal government and gets their funds. All they do is take over the legal, the new regulations. 
Um, send Larry Arn to talk to him. I think. Uh, <laughs> you know, no one understands the uh, the argument better, but you know, it it, it it is all these things boil down to uh, politicians are opinion followers. They're not a they're not opinion leaders. They reflect what they hear at home, and they'll get away with what they can get away with. And part of the reason I think the Tea Party is such a positive development, and, and it's different than the Wall Street uh, Occupy Wall Street group so far, is that they're trying to understand how they can participate in good government. And like I said, I had town hall meetings, nobody came, but if you hold a town hall meeting today, you're gonna get a lot of people if you're a member of Congress. And so people have woken up, they've decided that their government isn't what they expect it to be, and they're trying to communicate through the political process with elected officials. And the Tea Party, I think, you know, surprised themselves in the uh, things they were able to accomplish in the 2010 election. I think that they will continue on that. People who dismissed that they peaked, I think, are all wrong. I think that the Tea Party is just starting to learn uh, the, uh, uh, its potential in, in impacting elections. So you just have to go talk to them and you have to make it clear that uh, this isn't what you want as a citizen. We, I am a Tea Partier. We have, we are doing that. We are fighting it on every level to slot, but we don't Ult well, the ultimate answer is the ballot box. Uh, the ultimate answer is that you get to vote every four years for governor. And, uh, and they understand that very well. Yes, uh, what particular policies in terms of sending us a certain time of reform and uh, tax, changing tax policies for growth uh, do you recommend? Well, this is going to be a cop-out answer. Um, the Club for Growth is not a policy organization. We steal from the Cato Institute, from Heritage, and from AEI and others. What we do is that we try to comment on proposals. And uh, as an example, uh, Rick Perry came out with a proposal this week. Uh, we were highly complimentary of his proposal. And if any of you haven't looked at it, I'd encourage you to do that. We have not made an endorsement in the presidential uh, election, but we think that his proposal is bold. Uh, it gets to the reforms. It has a spending cap of 18%, which is an extraordinary thing if you could do it. It has a balanced budget amendment. It has an optional flat tax at 20%. It sunsets a lot of provisions. It has a lot of um, audits of, of current regulations and agencies. Um, so what we try to do is make sure people understand what's being proposed and what are the pros and the cons of those um, those uh, proposals. Now that being said, we you know we don't take a position on fair or flat tax. We think either one would be better. Um, we think lower lower taxes are better than higher taxes. But this is, and this isn't the question, but this is the, this is the real question, I think, that we all are going to face. We heard this morning that the super committee uh, will likely fail, and that's probably true, or else they'll do something that will be very disappointing, and none of us will believe that they'll actually achieve the cuts that they say they'll get. A more interesting question is if they could get to a point where they propose fundamental tax reform by broadening the base and lowering the rates, and the math just happens to work out that revenue goes up. Would a Pat Toomey or a Jeb Henserling or the Club for Growth or Grover Norquist or any groups think that's okay? And that's, uh, that's a very complicated question because if you, lowered the, if you broaden the base and lowered the rates, you could make an argument, depending on what they're offering, that that's very pro-growth. And if you believe in the Laffer curve, you shouldn't have a problem if revenue goes up. Because if you believe in economic growth and the pie gets bigger, that's a natural outcome. And so that's what we would love to see. That's what we'd love to comment on, are real proposals like that. I don't know where we'd come out or anyone else would come out, but if the super committee was gonna do its job, I think there is a scenario where they could get the votes to support something like that. Um, but everyone's gonna have to be very disciplined, I think, in their criticism and study it before they comment on it. Do you see a movement back to long-term considerations rather than short-term? The reason I say this is because one of the things I've observed in the last 30, 40 years is the, is the tendency to look only at the short-term effects of something. And of course, this is not just in Congress, 
Um, on the term limits, yes, I think two of the greatest reforms that we could have in America is one is nonpartisan redistricting. <laughs> Uh, if you could actually achieve that, because there's so many safe seats in America that people aren't motivated by the voters. Um, and two would be term limits. That's not an issue that's on our menu at the Club for Growth. Uh, I took a term limit pledge when I was in Congress. My term ended up being more limited than I pledged. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I do think the term limits uh, would be a great reform and uh, help, you know, help, help, help us to get better government. As far as the short-term versus the long-term view, uh, I, I don't see it, you know, I, every, every question I say, is this new or has it always been like this? I think it's always been like this. I think that's human nature. And certainly when members of the House have to run every two years, they have a very, very short-term view. Uh, but what, the one thing I learned when I was in Congress is the only thing that really matters is who pushes the button. And what do they get to push the button for or against? You have this little card, a vote card, and there's a little machine, you stick it in, and there's yes, no, or present. And so, who's pushing the button? What do they get to push it for or against? And legislative bodies are team sports, and you need more of their, your guys than they have of their guys. And you need to have enough guys to get to send the agenda. And so, until you get people that are committed to doing the hard things, and that's what we do, with, I'm not here to pitch the Club for Growth, but that's the only thing we do at the Club for Growth, is try to improve the gene pool of Congress by finding champions of economic freedom. We'll take these beliefs, to Washington because you'll never find them there. And so they're willing to take the risk of leadership, they're willing to put their job on the line by taking hard votes because there's this circular argument in Washington. I have to take, I have to be irrelevant today so I can be around and be irrelevant tomorrow. Because if I'm relevant, I might lose. And so you have to find people that are willing to get beyond that. We have been successful in finding some people, a lot from South Carolina. If the whole, I was just saying if the whole country was like South Carolina, the country would be a better place. Um, but, uh, but it's human nature more than it is, I think, anything right now. So, yeah, I'd like to connect what, what you've said about um, the election. Well, um, if I understand, we're holding the gun to our own head. We, we, the people of America get to decide this. The, but the reality is, our, you bring up ARP. Uh, AARP is a um, special interest group. It's a lot of members. I don't think they're members. I don't think they, they necessarily reflect the views of their members all the time. Um, but they have 50 million members or whatever it is, and they vote. That's the key, is they vote. And so we heard this morning, 70-year-olds vote 70%, 30-year-olds vote 30%. And that's the key. Until you get the people that are paying the bill to vote and have an educated vote, um, this, is a, this is a death spiral that we're in. And so you need politicians, and that's what we're trying to find at the Club for Growth and what we all should find, that are willing to tell the story, that are willing to level with the people. And I do think that certainly in my lifetime, people are more willing now than ever to listen. Uh, you can fix Social Security relatively easy. There's a thing called progressive indexing. It takes care of 70 plus percent of the, pro the, the problem. It can be demagogued politically, but it's, it's a responsible way to do it. Social Security has about four moving parts. Medicare and Medicaid have about a thousand moving parts. Um, until we can get to the point where we can address, have a serious discussion about Social Security, th the future is challenging. Uh, but it all boils down to who votes and, uh, uh, and getting people that are willing to fight the fight. So, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.